Hey, y'all. Good morning. So good to see you. And uh, before I start my sermon, uh, a couple of the band members reminded me this week. They said, you know what? We couldn't be as solid and strong as we are without an amazing team behind us that's doing AV and video and lights and things. And so can we just, we often don't thank them. Can we just thank all those people? Real quick. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, band, thank you for reminding me of that. And we couldn't do it without y'all. Well, this morning, grace and peace and love and joy in Jesus be with you all. We are in a sermon series currently called A Life That Counts, right? We've been, we've been walking through stories of Jesus and looking at them. How do they apply to our lives? How do they make sense for us? And so we can see ourselves in these stories as well to see where God's doing amazing things in us and through us, right? So let's just recap a, a little bit to get us to where we are today. Jesus has been born. He's grown up. He was in the temple. He, uh, his mom and dad couldn't find him. And then he grew up a little bit more. And then he was in the baptized. And then he went out and was tempted. See how fast we're going through the first few chapters really quickly. And then he came into Nazareth and he opened up the scroll of Isaiah and said, this has been fulfilled today right? They're like, you're just from Nazareth. You're, you grew up here, right? And then what they do? They try to kill him. But of course, Jesus being who he is, miraculously somehow navigates out of that. And then he goes on to another town and they love him and want to hear it. He's casting out demons. He's healing people. He's welcoming them in. He's preaching the gospel. And they're like, don't leave us. We love this. Thank you for coming. They said, I have to preach this to other people. Other people need to hear this. Which takes us to today. Open up to Luke 5, verse 1. It's page 860 for those who want to get there fast in the Pew Bible. We're going to use that translation today, ESV. Uh, if you're at home, open it up on your phone. Uh, open it up wherever you are. We're going to dig in. Luke 5, chapter 1. Luke 5, verse 1. So let's, let's jump right in. On one occasion, don't you just love that? A lot of times, how many of you just go, on one occasion, let's get to this stuff, right? But all of a sudden, on one occasion, what does that mean? It means Luke's like, this happened a lot. This is one of those times. The apostle John in his gospel says, there are not enough books in the world to contain everything Jesus did, if we wrote them all down. So in those three little words, all of a sudden we're realizing this is just a little taste, but something big is going to happen on this occasion. Let's jump back in. While the crowd was, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret. So those of you that are old enough to remember Black Friday pre-Cyber Monday, when I was in college, every Thanksgiving break, my, butt, my brother, my cousin, and a buddy of mine, we would get up at 3 a.m. This is Minnesota, by the way, in November. Oh. And we would get up and we would wait outside Best Buy because there's always some like 75, 80% off thing. You know, it was like CDRs, but I mean, we didn't have any money. But you remember all the people pressing in on those shops back then. If you ever braved it, people were like, oh, I got to get into Walmart. People even got stomped, right? Remember hearing about that? It's sad. Stampedes. So put that in your mind crowds pressing in on Jesus against the edge of the lake. And what does Jesus do? He sees a solution, like he always does. And he uses the things of this world. Let's keep looking. Oh, by the way, we can go back to the, the we can go to the picture. This is Lake Genesaret, also known as, anybody? Sea of Galilee, or the Sea of Tiberias. This is the modern day look. There were not big, you know, structures like that back then. And we didn't have photos. Um, so you could bike around it in a day. It's not that big. It's where Jesus walked on water. It's where he calmed the sea. And where this one occasion, something big would happen. He saw two boats by the lake. We're in verse two now. But the fishermen had got out of them and were washing their nets. So Jesus all of us realizes, I'm not going to be able to teach these people. I'm going to get thrown into the water. They're going to press me in. Something's going to happen. I want to be able to teach them. There's some boats. I'll, I'll use a boat. Just like he used bread and fish to feed 5,000. Simple things for his good. 
So he uses that and sees it, gets in there. And what happens next? Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's. So can you imagine this? Like, you've got a boat, and just some guy gets in it, and you're like, hey, man, it's my boat, right? It's kind of like when I have my guitar out here. If people don't ask, it's okay, I forgive them. But I would rather you ask before you play it, you know? Just pick it up and start playing it. And then just get, into, just get into a boat. And Simon, Peter, who is Simon? I already kind of gave it away. Simon, who would later be named Peter, who Christ would build his church upon, that's Simon. Simon sitting over here, can you imagine him? Water, boat, people crushing, and he's like, I just want to clean my nets. It's been a long day. And here they come into my space, you know, getting this stuff done. And then this guy gets into a boat. But it's not just any guy. This is the same man who was in his house with his mother-in-law just a chapter before. She has a fever. Who knows if she's going to make it? And this man who's getting into my boat is the one that was in my home healing her and removing the fever. So Simon knows this isn't just anybody. This is somebody special. But he doesn't know it all yet. Let's, let's jump back into the text. And Jesus asked him to put out a little from the land. To put out a little bit. So what does that mean? Well, you know, think of a boat. It's right here. And either one of two things, either Jesus was in it, and, you know, you just push him out, right? And it's like, well, see you, Jesus. <laughs> Hope you do okay. Now, I'm guessing probably not for you fishermen who own a nice boat or something and you want to take care of it, you get in the boat, right? And you take them out there so that you can take care of your boat. That's what I'm guessing. It doesn't say if he was in it or not. So he puts out, but what does that mean? He's got to take a step. Because often when God calls us, it just starts with one innocent, faithful step don't realize what he's doing often, but it starts with one step. Just put the boat out. In my life, uh, God has done that many times, but I wanted to share with you one story. When I was in 10th grade, um, I wanted to be an aerospace engineer since I was little, like my uncle. He's worked for Boeing forever, just recently retired, and I, I love flight. I love flight. I'm, I'm still intrigued by it. But in 10th grade, my band director said, you know, I've got these elementary students that I don't have time to teach piano to. You're a good musician. You're good with people. You want to make some extra money? I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll make some money. How hard is this going to be? So I start teaching them every week, take on a guitar student. And over the course of a year, I fall in love with them seeing and learning, and the light bulb coming on, and falling in love with music, and being a part of that with them. I did that so much that I decided, you know, I might want to go to college and learn to be a music teacher, which I did. It just, the dominoes fell, the small steps just kept growing, and for 11 years, I taught as a called church worker in Lutheran schools for 11 years before I came here, and it was awesome, and I still teach private lessons today. Often a calling starts with one faithful step. So what happens next? And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, whoa, let's just stop there. I know it's right in the middle, but you got to notice something. You got to read between the lines here. When he had finished speaking. So how long did he speak? Did he do one of those Jesus one-liner sermons? You know those? When he goes, give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what's God's. Mic drop. You know, and everyone's standing there like, wow. Those are great sermons. We should do those more often, right, guys? Uh, and, or was it like a Sermon on the Mount? A couple chapters, everyone's kind of comfortable. Let's hear a lot of story. 
Or was it, you know, Apostle Paul type? Like hours and hours, people are falling out of windows and brought back to life. And who knows how long it was. But we know one thing. Simon had to wait and listen. Whether he's in the boat or not. And guess what, y'all? He, didn't, he couldn't tune him out and just check his stocks and play Wordle and go on Facebook. Right? We can tune people out all the time. We've got these tuning out machines. But Simon just sat there and he listened. In my life, after God called me all the way through school and through teaching music for all those years, he was teaching me so that I could listen and learn and just be washed in this call that he had given me. Little faithful steps throughout the whole thing. But it was a waiting time. So God would call me here and do something new. I love it here. But what happened next? Then he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. You've come this far. You've taken a faithful step. Now, you're with me on this. You've heard me speak Let's go out. Let's go a little deeper. Let's go a little deeper, Simon. It was 2018 when I was reading in this exact Bible that I read about the one body, that we are one bread, one body, and in Christ we are united. And in, as I was studying this, in bed, in the morning, drinking my coffee, next to my beautiful wife who was studying her Bible, and I, and I heard the Lord say, I need you to go to seminary, and I need you to be a part of this unity of the body and help bring the church together in your space that I give you. This is important to me. And I was like, whoa. He said, I want you to come a little further. I want you to come a little deeper. But what did Simon say when God asked him to come a little deeper? After listening to this long sermon, what did he say? You guys find it? Verse 6. Wait, is that? I can't read it. <laughs> Look, verse 5. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. Do you ever get called by God and you just kind of like uh, push back? You just push back and you go, and I can hear, I, because I know I've been there, Simon saying, I've been out to the deep water. I was there all night. I took nothing. There's nothing out there. There's nothing for me there. Why are you asking me to go there, Jesus? I listened to all your stuff. You healed my mother-in-law. Thank you. But you know what? I have to go home to my wife tonight. When I hug her and I run my hands through her dark hair and she goes, how was your day, honey? I'm so glad to see you. How did it go? I have to say to her, I got nothing. I brought nothing home. I failed. I failed you. I failed our family. I hope you have enough to eat. I hope our neighbors help us out because I have nothing even to pay the guys with. And right now I feel like nothing. And when God said to me, I need you to go. I pushed back so hard. I actually have it written in the notes in here because I said, what about money? We're a one-income family. How am I going to spend tens of thousands of dollars on a degree? How am I going to spend time with my family? I want to be a good father, a good husband. I love the church. I, I spend a lot of time with everyone. How am I going to fit this in, this study? What about all this, like, book learning? I don't need more book learning, right, Jesus? I just, I'm going where you so, where you go. Where you go, I go. Why do I need this? But what did Peter say? What did Simon say? Right after that. Will you read it with me? He says, but at your word, I will let down the nets. At your word. The word that he spoke over his mother-in-law and healed her. The word that he had traveled through the village and through the town that this new teacher was preaching, this new kingdom. This word of hope and light. This word that he had been listening to for that whole time sitting in the boat. The word 
that so many Sunday school teachers, camp counselors, my parents, DCEs, who raised me up, professors who walked with me and spoke God's word into my life. My dad, when I would sit on the toilet in the morning and, and he's shaving and I'm brushing my teeth and I'm like, what about Adam and Eve? How did that work? You know, and he was so patient with me, speaking the word over me with an inquisitive little boy. That word, because of that word, I'll let down the nets. Faithful step after faithful step, he calls us deeper. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so they began to sink. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine a boat? I'm not talking about canoe. This is probably a good-sized boat, right? So many fish that they couldn't handle it. Provision beyond imagination. Provision beyond the fact, beyond human understanding and physical limits of the world, right? So their boat and their nets, if they lost that fish, they'd be out the fish, right? But if they lost the fish and the nets broke and the ship sank, they're out of everything. Hindsight's 2020, y'all. We're like, they're going to get it and they're going to be disciples. It's going to be awesome. But they're in the middle of this and everything's sinking and they're like, Jesus, you're awesome. Thank you for this fish. But if everything breaks, wherever it all is lost. Sometimes God's provision seems so overwhelming to us, we don't even know what to do. But he gives us even more than we need. Right? You see, when I was in this Bible and God called me and had all these things to push back at him, he had answers for everything. When I had talked about the finances, he said, I'm going to take care of it. Don't even ask me about that. That's the peace I had. You know, I, I haven't heard God's audible voice like some of my friends have, but it feels like a download, almost like it's typed somewhere, and I just felt this peace. And then when I thought about my family and I asked him about my family, I just felt, the war I just felt warm and embraced and just this peace of like, I've got you. You're going to be okay. And I have amazing pastoral staff and y'all who have given me time and space and my family and so patient to allow me to do this. And then with the knowledge stuff, I'm like, I don't need to know all that stuff. And he said, I'm not worried about that. I have things to show you. And show me he has. He's shown me how friends of mine who are in all the different denominations you could imagine as we become friends and want the same thing for the world that we have more in common than we have a not common. And it's such joy of how, what he's provided beyond what I could imagine. Can you think of those times in your life when you asked and he called you and he just gave you more than you needed? Sometimes you don't even notice but he does it. So let's get back to the story here. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at his knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Y'all, when God did this amazing thing, you would think, right, us knowing Jesus, who he is, we'd be like, Thank you, Jesus. You're amazing. Hug. You know what I mean? You're, you live in me. You're, you're my friend, right? But Peter, Simon falls to his knees in repentance. Why? Well, you got to go back to Isaiah and realize that Isaiah said, Woe to me, God, don't smite me and destroy me because I'm, in, because I'm part of a sinful people, a sinful nation, and I've been in the presence of the Almighty. Don't. Because, y'all, this is still pre-resurrection. There's still a curtain in the temple. There's still, you can't go back there. You can't go into that place behind the curtain. Only certain priests can. We're still kind of Old Testament right now. Jesus hasn't died yet. So Simon's all of a sudden, do you know why I did that? Because Simon realized that there is no humanly possible way that this could have happened and that this man who healed my mother-in-law must be the almighty God. 
and I'm in the presence of the Almighty God. And there are times in my life like this when I said to him, even a few weeks after he was calling me and doing this, and Emily even said, we got to go. She had peace about it, which is a big deal in this situation because we're doing this together. And that's when I knew it was real. But I couldn't get over the finance stuff. I couldn't get over how are we going to pay for this. And so guess what? I found out that Fuller Seminary gives like really good scholarships to people who got really good grades in undergrad. I'm like, cha-ching. I worked my tushy off for that. Now it's going to pay off, right? So I'm going to apply for this, and I'm going to get all this money, and it's going to be good. God, see what you're doing. Yeah, God, I got it all figured out. And months go by, and I don't get this scholarship or even mention of it. So I call them. They go, oh, that was due blank. Five days after the call to go, there's no way I'd get that turnaround. Pastor's writing references for me in five days. No way. Pastor Bond, it's, it's okay. So what happened is I went to God and I said, this is not how it's going to go. It's not good. But I was mad. You called me to this. You're gonna, you said you're going to provide, right? And in that moment, I felt like he said, those grades have always been an idol for you. You've made it about your achievement. And that's not how I'm going to do this. And you need to let them go. And that's when I wept. And I realized that I was in the presence of God and he had called me and he was going to provide for me. And to this day, God has put people in my life and other, other ways, other, it's just God's provided the whole thing and I haven't had to worry about it. He took care of it. Because when God calls you that deep into his calling, into his following, he doesn't put you out there on the deep end by yourself. He goes with you and he takes care of it. He provides for you, my friends. Trust me, he says. So let's finish the story. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid that you're not going to be enough if you say yes to that? Are you afraid that someone's going to judge you afraid that you're too old and that God would never call you to something new at this stage of life? Are you too young, kids? God would never want to use me. He just uses adults. Do you think your parents are going to say, why would you do that? And they're going to judge you and you have to deal with all this family stuff. What are you afraid of? Because you know what, friends? All of us are at some point in being called. You may be still mending your nets, and just he wants you to put out to the water a little bit. Put the boat in the water. He may be calling you to have coffee with that neighbor who you keep saying no to that keeps asking. Just say yes. He may be saying, why don't you try a Bible study? I'd love you to be in the Word a little bit. Just put the boat in the water a little bit. Come with me. Come and see. Come and taste. It's good. But you may be at a point where he is busting open your nets and a lot is going on. And he's saying, it's time to go really deep. And we need to go to, you need to go to counseling and therapy and work through these wounds and these hurts. Because restoration for your family is necessary. And it's time. Say yes. Come with me. I'll go with you. Maybe he's saying, that job that you really want, where you're going to have joy and peace in it, but it's a little risky. But you have peace? Come. I've got you. Friends, we're all in some stage of being called. He's calling you. And your life counts. Your life counts because he's already called you. 
My friends, you are heirs. You are children of God. That scripture that Emily read earlier, it said, well, you are not slaves to fear no, any longer. You are children of God, heirs of the kingdom, keys to the, to the house. And he says, you're welcome. You are free. You are loved. You are mine. Let's go. There is no fear when I'm with you. So my friends, whatever, wherever you are, if you are at a point where you're like, I don't know how to handle this, I don't know how to discern this next step, but I do feel called, I want to let you know. Reach out to me, reach out to pastors. We would love to sit down with you and pray and discern where the Lord is calling you. That is a gift that we can give to you. You don't have to do this alone. We're a family and we're a team. And so wherever he is calling you next, I pray with faith that you would say yes. Amen. Let's pray. Most amazing God, we put our lives and our hands into your hands. And we know that you are reaching out your hand and calling us to come and bring us forward into life a little deeper to come with you. And we know, God, we trust that you will provide. You always provide. Our King, our love, call us deeper. In Jesus' name, amen.